Good morning, everyone. I'll just have a greeting on the YouTube chat. Hello, Michelle. Nice to see you. It's interesting. Um, my wife was just playing me some uh, Tibetan Buddhist mantra chatting, uh, chanting, and it sounds very much like Native American um, chants to me and to her as well. And it has done for um, 25 years or so. We got a recording year, years and years ago, and we realized it then. Um, and uh anyway i don't know what we're going to do with that but <laughs> well it's really good stuff to listen to yeah it is um and uh okay um all right so today we're going to get into the red one but before we get there um there's uh, one page here uh, called the images of the airing and um, the footnote for that title is the handwritten draft has quote the adventures of the wandering unquote and then before this begins there are two footnotes so I should read those. In, this, in his essay on Picasso in 1932, Jung described the paintings of schizophrenics, meaning here only those in which a psychic disturbance would probably produce schizoid symptoms rather than people who suffered from their condition, as follows, quote, from a purely formal point of view, the main characteristic is one of fragmentation, which expresses itself in the so-called lines of fracture, that is, a type of psychic fissure which runs right through the picture, unquote. And that's from Collective Works 15, uh, section 208. And the other... Uh, footnote number three here, and so I guess the numbering is in Liber Secundus. Um, these passages in Latin from the Bible were cited by Jung in Psychological Types, 1921, from Luther's Bible, and introduced with the following comments, quote, the form in which Christ presented the content of his unconscious to the world movement and of all other later for heresies testifies the prophet jeremiah is speaking just in this vein when he warns and unquote then there's a collective word six uh, paragraph 81 so here's the beginning of this paragraph or the images of the airing. Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, that prophesy unto you. I'll read that again. Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. That's from Jeremiah 23, verse 16. And here's another. I've heard that the prophet that the prophet said that prophecy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy that prophesy lies? 
Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream, and he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff of the wheat, saith the Lord? Jeremiah 23, 25 to 28. Um, okay, any comments on that, Michelle? Uh, basically, the way I see this, uh, I'll just move on. Uh, good morning, Art, um, and Vikas, and Richard. Anyway, um, the way I see this is that when Christ came and preached, he was preaching from his heart. And it resonated with a lot of people, a lot of people at that day and age. And the church fathers adopted it um, and said that anybody that has other visions or dreams just is not on so this is the only one that counts but the truth is that we all have uh, things coming from our unconscious and they're very very um, unique in their own way and uh, I've been seeing this in my work in school in the past week but um let me, uh, I'll, I'll share some of that with you in a moment. But Michelle or Nancy, does either one of you have a comment here on this? So. Um, well, I think it's really interesting to have a religious viewpoint of your higher power can emanate from within instead of going to a human so-called authority and i think that that's really radical religiously surely it's radical um and um i i <laughs> but having an exchange with someone today who used the term the derealization of history and basically uh, I concur with that because as soon as you put anything on pa on paper, it's no longer real. Then it's um, then it's just rails that we have to follow down, and until we we get something for ourselves. And the same is true of images. If we paint or sculpt something. Um, You know, when Michelangelo uh, painted God giving life to Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, um, that never happened in reality. It only happened in first in the psyche of Michelangelo and then because most of us or many of us accept it as exceptional, we see the origin of human life in that way. Many of us do, certainly uh, most Catholics do, and, and even uh, Protestants do, of course. And, um, and I'm sure that many others are very moved by that painting, but when Michelangelo did that painting, he was derealizing, um, derealizing what was happening. Okay, he was—he wasn't. The image isn't what really happened. The image is. It, think of it as a rail, a track, upon which others can think about these things and contemplate them. 
Michelle? Um, it's the matrix. Yeah. Like the power of the matrix. And one person does have the power to change things. Um, mm -hmm. So that's an example. Right. Right. And um, uh, the image of, uh, of David, also by M Michelangelo, it, which is in Florence, uh, it's a, I guess it's about 15 feet high and it's a marble statue. And uh, <laughs> uh, of course, there are many interesting things about it. Some people are trying to ban it in the United States, ban the image. Um, and this is partially because of our puritanical roots here. <laughs> um, but the reality is, uh, you know, that's a male human being, <laughs> right? That's how we are. And, um, or it's, it's an image that indicates how we are, although none of, very few of us uh, look that good <laughs> but <laughs> back in my 20s <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah yeah i can't say that it it ever emulated me but in any case um the point is that that mar that's that chunk of marble got brought uh next to a cathedral i believe it's a, in florence where it was and it got laid down there and nobody saw david until michelangelo did it it sat there as a big block of marble for 54 years and two other uh sculptors had made a start on it and then they just couldn't it was too overwhelming because it came from one piece of marble, right? That statue. And Michelangelo finally came and he saw David there in it. And, and he freed David. He brought David into reality. And, uh, and so um, I want to welcome Patrick to our panel here. Uh, Patrick, if you uh, reveal your video or unmute, uh, you, you can be heard and seen on YouTube, and that will be recorded just so you are aware of that. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to keep moving. So anyway. Um, oh, and um, where are we in the Red Book? We are on page... Uh, we're going over to 212 now uh, of the uh, reader's edition. We're talking using the reader's edition uh, of the Red Book by C.G. Young, uh, edited by Son edited and translated by Son Risham Dasani. Um, so, uh, Patrick, uh, do you wish to introduce yourself in any way? <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say hi real quick. I uh, found your YouTube channel and it's just got really good, uh, really good content on it. I don't even have a copy of the book yet, so what I know, I know from watching videos like yours. Uh huh. Okay. Well, that's that's hey, everyone. Perfect, that's perfectly fine. Um, right. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle, show yours too. It's not showing. It, it's it not keep, showing up. Yeah, it keeps getting. <laughs> overtaken by timber wolves but no never yeah mind. they're more important um so um so patrick uh the issue about Jungian psychology or reading carl Jung's work is uh there's no place to start you just dive in and uh see if you can swim <laughs> basically that's it and i dove in in 1987, so I've been sw swimming for a long time, 
And uh, so I have learned some things about myself and others uh, through the exercise. Um, so I will, uh, I'll move on to the red one, uh, because I think that's uh, part of the red book that many people find fascinating. And uh, let's see, uh, a couple of comments here before I go on. Uh, Richard says, Michelangelo had a close relationship with God, even if he didn't realize it. Um, well, he certainly had a close relationship with God, and I think he did realize it. And although it was painful for him because he he railed against having to do um, having to do uh, the Sistine Chapel, which took him four years and was quite painful to do because he had to lie on his back to do that painting for four years. And he, he was somewhat, accounts suggest uh, the agony and the ecstasy, the movie with Charlton Heston playing Michelangelo it suggests the agony of, you know, the physical agony of what he was doing. But one, it seems to me one doesn't do that unless one is somehow touched. Um, and I'll leave it to everyone to use their own definition what, of what I mean by touched. Um, and Art says, I, I struggle with how I see God from others. Um, and uh, well, I mean, this is an opportunity for me to read my favorite quote from the Radiant Sutras. So this is the Radiant Sutras um, by Lauren Roach. And Lauren Roach uh, took the Radiant Sutras um, and, um, and wrote an amazing book. It is a beautiful book. And um, I want to first read, uh, it came from the Bhairava uh, Tantra, um, and uh, it, it, this one paragraph in the introduction uh, that he wrote uh, sort of touches me very deeply. And he says, it's, it's under the heading, The Language of Love. The Bhairava Tantra is set as a conversation between the goddess, who is the creative power of the universe, and the god, who is the consciousness that permeates everywhere. For short, they call each other Devi and Bhairava, or Shakti and Shiva. They are lovers and inseparable partners, and one of their favorite places of dwelling is in the human heart. Okay, so but that is quite beautiful. But in terms of struggling with God, um, I am going to read uh, from the Banter book verses, uh, which is on page 23 of the Radiant, Radiant Sutras. This is um, uh, Lauren Roach's translation from the Sanskrit. So he's he's put the Sanskrit on one side and his translation in English on the other side. And so I'm re reading from his translation. Um, Elaborate rituals and garish images may be useful in meditation when your mind is whirling with thoughts of sex, money, and power, wandering like an elephant in heat. Go ahead and use these tools, yet no, beating drums and blaring trumpets cannot summon the one who is already present. I am not a collection of incantations known only to experts. I am not a ladder to be climbed a sequence for piercing energy centers in your body. 
I am not to be found at the end of a long road. I am right here. Okay. So in terms of what your struggle is, Art, uh, and I know something of your struggle, I would say that uh, that's very good advice to you about God. You don't have to struggle with him. He's right there with you. Yeah, I, go ahead, um, Michelle. Interject? Sure. Well, interject. Um, <clears throat> I'm new to young, but um, maybe I'm not because I have many years of recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I got my jump off point. And, mm -hmm. um, and then in the, the big book, page 47, I'll just read it, two paragraphs. When, therefore, we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. This applies, too, to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. At the start, this is all we needed to commence spiritual growth, to affect our first conscious relation with God as we understood him. Afterwards, we found ourselves accepting many things, which then seemed entirely out of reach. That was growth, but if we wished, but if we wished to grow, we had to begin somewhere. So we used our own conception, however limited it was. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we empathically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. And that's a promise on page 47 of the big book. Great. Uh, of what book, big book? The Bible? It's not my Bible, the big book. It's what just is it called, called the big book. It's called uh, the big book. Alcoholics Anonymous big book. Ah, okay. All right. Terrific book. Um, uh, let's see. I'm, I'm just typing in the uh, reference to our confluence for the fall uh, so that everybody early on here has access to the link. Um because we're we're going to experience this uh, in the fall, uh, and let me just see how long this the red one is. It's red one is, is uh, okay. Eight pages long. Uh, maybe we can get through it today. Uh, and. Um, so let me, I will read. Um, and so this is a, a chapter called um, The Red One, and there's a footnote. The corrected draft has uh, the great wandering one, the red one. And then there's another footnote. This depicts Jung's eye in the opening scene of this fantasy. So it's um, Jung's internal image of himself, basically, his, his self, which he's observing. The door of the mysterium has closed behind me. I feel that my will is paralyzed, and this, the spirit of the depths possesses me. I know nothing about a way. I can therefore neither want this nor that. Since nothing indicates to me whether I want this or that, I wait without knowing what I'm waiting for. But already in the following night, I felt that I had reached a solid point. And there's a footnote. The previous paragraph was added in the draft. And, uh, okay. And the date is uh, December 26th, 1913. Um, and so it's uh, 
the night after the Christmas night vision that he had. I find that I am standing on the highest tower of a castle. The air tells me so. I am far back in time. My gaze wanders widely over solitary countryside, a combination of fields and forests. I am wearing a green garment. A horn hangs from my shoulder. I am the tower guard. I look out into the distance. I see a red point out there. It comes nearer on a winding road, disappearing for a while on for in forests and reappearing again. It is a horseman in a red coat, the red horseman. He is coming to my castle. He is already riding through the gate. I hear steps on the stairway. The steps creak. He knocks. A strange fear comes over me. There stands the red one, his long shape wholly shrouded in red. Even his hair is red. I think, in the end, he will turn out to be the devil. Then there's this uh, dialogue, dialogue exchange. The red one. I greet you, man on the high tower. I saw you from afar, looking and waiting. Your waiting has called me. I, who are you? Red one, who am I? You think I am the devil? Do not pass judgment. Perhaps you can also talk to me without knowing who I am. What sort of superstitious fellow are you that immediately you think of the devil? I, if you have no supernatural ability, how could you feel that I stood waiting on my tower? looking out for the unknown and the new. My life in the castle is poor, since I always sit here and no one climbs up to me. Red one. So what are you waiting for? I. I wait all things. All, I wait all kinds of things, and especially I'm waiting for some of the world's wealth, which we don't see here, to come to me. Red one. So I have come to absolutely the right place. I have wandered a long time through the world, seeking those like you who sit upon a high tower on the lookout for things unseen. I, you make me curious. You seem to be a rare breed. Your appearance is not ordinary. And then too, forgive me, it seems to me that you bring with you a strange air, something worldly something impudent and exuberant, or, in fact, something pagan. Red one. You don't offend me. On the contrary, you hit your, na your nail on the head, but I'm no old pagan, as you seem to think. I. I don't want to insist on that. You are also not pompous and Latin enough. You, <laughs> you have nothing classical about you. You seem to be a son of our time. But as I must remark, a rather unusual one, you're no real pagan, but the kind of pagan that runs alongside our Christian religion. Red one, you're truly a good divine, diviner of riddles. You're doing better than many others who have totally mistaken me. I, you sound cool and sneering. Have you never broken your heart over the holiest mysteries of our Christian religion? Red one, you're an unbelievably ponderous and serious person. Are you always so urgent? I, I would be for God always like to be as serious and true to myself as I tried to be. However, that certainly becomes difficult in your presence. You bring a certain gallows air with you, and you're bound to be from the black school of Salerno, where the pernicious arts are taught by pagans and the descendants of pagans. And the footnote after the black school of Salerno. Salerno is a town in southwest Italy uh, founded by the Romans. Jung may have been referring to the Academia Segreta, which 
was established in the 1540s and promoted alchemy. Okay, comments so far? We're right here in the midst of it. Any comments? No? Uh, let's see. Um, okay, Snake says, "Why thy will not mine be done. Uh, uh, Richard says, spirituality and the good things of God can be the cure for all kinds of disorders. Okay, well, one, one can hope. All right, I'm carrying on with the reading. The red one. You're superstitious and too German. You take literally what the scriptures say. Otherwise, you could not judge me so hard. I. A hard judgment is the last thing I would want. But my nose does not play tricks on me. You're evasive and don't want to reveal yourself. What are you hiding? The red one seems to get redder. His garments shine like glowing iron. Red one. I had nothing from you, you true-hearted soul. I simply amuse myself with your weighty seriousness and your comic, comic veracity. This is so rare in our time, especially in men who have understanding at their disposal. I, I believe you cannot fully understand me. You apparently compare me with those whom you know, but I must say to you for the sake of truth that I neither really belong to this time nor to this place. A spell has banished me to this place and time for years. I am really not what you see before you. Red one, you say astounding things. Who are you then? I, that is irrelevant. I stand before you as that which I presently am. Why am I here and like this? I do not know. But I do know that I must be here to justify myself according to my best knowledge. I know just a little who are who you are as you know who I am. I, I'll read that again. I know just as little who you are as you know who I am. Red one. This sounds very strange. Are you something of a saint? Hardly a philosopher, since you have no aptitude for scholarly language. But a saint? Surely that. Your solemnity smells of fanaticism. You have an ethical air and a simplicity that smacks of stale bread and water. I, I can say neither yes nor, nor no. You speak as one trapped in the spirit of this time. It seems to me that you lack the terms of comparison. Red one, perhaps you attended the school of the pagans. You answer like a sophist. How can you then measure me with the yardstick of the Christian religion if you are no saint? Okay, and there's a footnote to the reference to sophists. The sophists were Greek philosophers in the 4th and 5th centuries BCE, centered in Athens and included figures such as Protagoras, Gorgias, and Hippias. They gave lectures and took on students for fees and paid particular attention to teaching rhetoric. Plato's attack in a number of dialogues gave rise to the modern negative connotation of the term and as anyone who plays with words. Okay, so we hear of sophistry where people are using words to mislead people, for example. We see a lot of sophistry today. Okay, so uh, let me read on. I'll reread uh, the Red One's um, line. Perhaps you attended the school of the pagans. You answer like a sophist. How can you then measure me with the yardstick of the Christian religion if you are no saint? I. it seems to me, though, that one can apply this yardstick even if one is no saint. I believe I have learned that no one is allowed to avoid the mysteries of the Christian religion unpunished. 
I repeat, he whose heart has not been broken over the Lord Jesus Christ drags a pagan around in himself who holds him back from the best. Red one. Again, this old tune. What for if you are not a Christian saint? Are you not a damn sophist after all? I, you are ensnared in your own world, but you certainly seem to think that one can assess the worth of Christianity correctly without being a downright saint. Red one, are you a doctor of theology who examines Christianity from the outside and appreciates its hit, it historically, and therefore a sophist after all? I, you're stubborn. What I mean is that it's real, It's hardly a coincidence that the whole world has become Christian. I also believe that it was the task of Western man to carry Christ in his heart and to grow with his suffering, death, and resurrection. Red one. Well, there are no. There are also Jews who have good, who are good people, and yet had no need for your solemn gospels. I, you are, it seems to me, no good reader of people. Have you never noticed that the Jew himself lacks something? One in his head, another in his heart, and he himself feels that he lacks something. Red one, indeed, I'm no Jew, but I must come to the Jew's defense. You seem to be a Jew hater. I, well, now you speak like all those Jews who accuse anyone of Jew hating who does not have a completely favorable judgment. Okay. Who do who does not have a completely favorable judgment while while they themselves make the bloodiest jokes about their own kind, since the Jews only too clearly feel that particular lack, and yet do not want to admit it, they are extremely sensitive to criticism. Do you believe that Christianity left no mark on the souls of men, and do you believe that one who has not experienced this must intimately can most intimately can still partake of its fruit. The red one. You argue your case well, but your solemnity, you could make matters much easier for yourself. If you're no saint, I really don't see why you have to be so solemn. You're you wholly spoil the fun. What the devil is troubling you? Only Christianity, with its mournful escape from the world, can make people so ponderous and sullen. I, I think there are still other things that bespeak seriousness. Red one. Oh, I know what you mean. I know. You mean life. I know this phrase. I too live and I don't let your, my hair turn white over it. Life doesn't require any seriousness. On the contrary, it's better to dance through life. I, I know how to dance. Yes, would we, would we could do it by dancing. Dancing goes with the mating season. I know that there are those who are always in heat and those who also want to dance for their gods. Some are ridiculous and so others enact antiquity instead of honestly admitting their utter incapacity for such expression. The red one. Here, my dear fellow, I doff my mask. Now I grow somewhat more ser serious, since this concerns my own province. It's conceivable that there is some third thing for which dancing would be the symbol. The red of the rider transforms itself into a tender reddish flesh color. And behold, O oh miracle, my green garments everywhere burst into leaf. Perhaps I, 
Perhaps, too, there is a joy before God that one can call dancing, but I haven't yet found this joy. I look out for things that are yet to come. Things came, but joy was not among them. The red one, don't you recognize me, brother? I am joy. I, could you be joy? I see you as through a cloud. Your image fades. Let me take your hand, beloved. Who are you? Who are you? Joy. Was he joy? Okay, that, there's a break here in the action, so I'll stop there for a moment. Um, there are a couple of footnotes. Um, no one can flout the spiritual development of many centuries and reap what they have not sowed. And in Nietzsche, thus spake Zarathustra, there's, there, Zarathustra admonishes the overcoming of the spirit of gravity and urges, you hire men, the worst thing about you is none of you has learned to dance as a man ought to dance, to dance beyond yourselves. And that comes from uh, part of the essay of Hire, of the Higher Men, page 306 from Nietzsche's book, This, this, this Spoke Zarathustra. Any comment? Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll read some uh, YouTube comments. The more I learn of alchemy, the harder it is to find anything of God in it. Perhaps it truly is the devil wrapped in sublimity. And Jamie says, perhaps, Richard, Jesus does break one's heart. Uh, and Jamie says, so is this just reading? And Richard says, and then he heals it. And then if you trust in him, all your fears go away. Okay. Any comments from my panel? Well, I was really enraptured with the panel. Um, the conversation sounds like a typical argument I have with my mother on a <laughs> holiday. <laughs> so I it's very I, I know how emotional it is when you're trying to like argue your point and the other person is like why are you so serious why are you taking it lighten up and it's like I wish I could <laughs> okay. Um, okay well I have a mysterious thing that has appeared uh, to to me in a painting in the in the last week, but I'm I'm not going to share that until the end of this chapter. Um, so anyway, uh, Patrick, any thoughts here? No, I was just about to ask you in the chat if uh, was he in a hypnagogic state or a meditative state when he did this active imagination. Uh, I would call it, uh, I would say yes to your compound question. I mean, it, it depends on what, how you define a hypnagogic state or a meditative state. Um, yes, he was in, he was experiencing his own conscious, unconscious, and that's what active imagination is. And so, for example, when when I had my very serious experience with active imagination, uh, it emerged over an eight month period in the form of a novel. And um, it woke me every morning at 6 a.m. Uh, and what I saw was a 15 year old Japanese woman in kimono waking me up every morning every morning and she directed me to go to my computer and turn the 
the brightness of my monitor down as much as I could get it so I could barely see the words and then just begin to type. And um, I have no recollection of actually typing this novel. That's but amazing. It simply appeared to me as a vision. Uh, and in your mind's eye. Well, surely it was in my mind's eye, but it also right. went on to the screen, right? And, or as I described it on the screen. And um, yeah, let's see. It, it basically forced me to write 500 to 1,000 words every day. And, and so I wrote from eight in the morning to or six to eight in the morning every day with all the lights in the house off and with the screen almost invisible and with my hands on the keyboard, but no recollection of typing. I saw the novel. Mm -hmm. do that for the that period of time and in later years as i've studied young um i've come to see that um that novel as the autobiography of my anima um for a period of 33 years uh or you know 33 years and it emerged because of a question that I asked my father. I asked my father a question when I was 15 years old. Um, and, and partially this emerged when I was, uh, how old was I? I was 40. I was 47 years old when this happened. And, um, I um, oh, I read an article uh, by Michael Crichton in the in the Wall Street Journal, and he was asked the question, "How do you write a novel?" And I was in a turning point of my life, and so I was trying to figure out what it is that um, I wanted to do with my life. And uh, so when Norman Schwarzkopf came back from Desert Storm and had his war parade in Washington, um, I was appalled. I'm a retired lieutenant colonel from the Marine Corps, but I don't believe in the aggrandizement of our military. Uh, and every, every time somebody says, thank you for your service, for me, it's like somebody running fingernails across a truck truck board because I don't believe in the aggrandizement of our military. I did what I did for my own reasons, and uh, I am satisfied with my reasons and the results is what I would say. And uh, I don't need anybody who has no clue what my reasons were to comment on it, <laughs> if, if I could put it that way. Um, and so I was in a transition period. I was sort of in my midlife crisis, let's say. And I went for a long walk. I didn't want to watch the war parade on, on TV. I actually wrote a poem about it. And... Um, But I didn't want to watch it on TV. And so um, I went for a walk around the U.S. Capitol. I lived on Capitol Hill at the time. And I was asking myself, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> what do I want to be when I grow up? And Michael Creighton's uh, 
article came to mind and I said, oh, wow, I want to be a writer. And uh, it was only later that I realized that I've always been a writer. <laughs> I've been a lawyer since I was uh, 28 years old, and I've always made my le living by writing, uh, but always for somebody else. But this is writing from myself for myself. And uh, so I took Michael Creighton's comment, which was, how do you write a novel? You ask a question. So his example was for Jurassic Park, um, how, what would happen if you could bring dinosaurs back to life? Okay, that was his question. And that produced Jurassic Park, that question. And so I had asked my question, my question to my father when I was 15 years old. I was living in Japan in a Japanese house, not on the military base. And we had a, a live-in housekeeper who was 23 years old. I was 15. So she was quite a, a numinous young woman for me, right? And I, one Saturday morning, I recall asking my father, well, Dad, uh, why is Michiko living with us? And he said, well, Japanese farm girls um, traditionally come to Tokyo to earn their dowry, quote unquote. That's what he said. That was his answer. And um, so on this particular afternoon, 33 years later, um, I guess it was 31 years later, that question came to my mind. And I, I said, okay, so what would the life of such a woman be if she came to Tokyo to earn her dowry and ultimately became the first woman prime minister of Japan? Okay, that was the question that I asked. What would her life be like when she came to Tokyo and how would it evolve in such a way that she became the first woman prime minister of Japan? That was the question. And the next morning she woke me up at 6 a.m. And she continued to do that uh, for eight months until I finished the novel. And once it was over, it was done. It was done. And I haven't really had an urge to write a novel again. I've written poetry. I've written nonfiction. But uh, that was the only novel that ever emerged. Um, but I have the sense that uh, from, that ex from that experience that... Um, That's how a great novelist works. And uh, Ernest Hemingway um, was asked how he, how he works in his writing of a novel. And he says, well, I open a vein and bleed. And that was his metaphor for opening a pathway to his unconscious and then bleeding out the the right the material so um you probably remember that hemingway served as an ambulance driver during world war one and uh he obviously saw a lot of carnage during that time and um and if you've never read for whom a bell tolls you you should because it's um uh, perfect example of what I'm talking about. He was speaking from his own experience. In my case, I was writing in part from my own experience because I've spent eight years in Japan. I went to high school there, and then I went back 16 years later and built a company there for five years. So um, I wrote from my experience. And so um, Even though my story is a novel, I can say that every word of it is true. And it, every word of it happened, 
either to me or to, to someone I know intimately. Okay, that's what I would say about it. But it is the autobiography of my anima, is what I would say. And so during that active imagination period, whether I was in a hypnogogic state or a meditative state, I don't know how I would, I, I was in an active imagination and it was emerging from my unconscious. Now, parts of this novel are uh, intensely erotic and that caused me um, because I know a lot about how Japanese society works, of course, um, and parts of it are intensely erotic. And so, um, you know, when I was finished with it, it was like molten iron, right? And I put it in my drawer for 16 years. And um, then, um, in 2009, the Red Book emerged, and I read it, and I immediately recognized myself in the Red Book. Okay, now the Red Book has nothing to do with my novel, nothing whatsoever. Okay, obviously, Jung never heard of me, and, and, uh, but I recognized the state and the active imagination state. Because at the time, I didn't know if I was crazy, if I had gone crazy in writing this novel and I was having, and of course, I'm a layman, so I didn't have any context for it in 1993. Uh, you know, I read a little young, but not enough to really comprehend what that meant. And, um, but when I read the Red Book, I said, oh, my God, if this can happen to the most gifted psychiatrist, psychologist of the 20th century, then I guess I'm OK. <laughs> I'm not crazy. Right. And so then I said, OK, I will. Um, I will publish my novel when I'm 70 years old. And so I did, I, um, I did publish it um, a little early. I published it in um, 2014, I believe, on Kindle. So the title of my novel is Mako Memoirs of a Woman, OK? And, uh, you know, you'll have, it, you'd have to read it to appreciate what I'm talking about. So it's, it's available on Kindle. I have not, nobody's offered to publish it in hard copy for me, and I have not made hard copies available, although, it, you know, I filed the copyright and all that stuff. Uh, so does that answer your question? That's a long answer to a question, oh. but I guess it needed to be answered. Are we doing story time, Skip? I want to do story time. <laughs> okay. All right. Story time. Um, well, you know, since um, I'm relatively new here. Uh, oh, darn. It's hard to talk about yourself, but it's all true. hundred um, percent. Well, let me see. In the beginning of the COVID pandemic, of course, it all happened during COVID. I was engaged to a former Marine. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was it. I thought it was it. I thought, you know, we were, we were living together. We had a house. We had dogs. I thought it was it. And I thought that we were just going to sail off onto the sunset life was set, all my life was set, everything. And then I agreed to let his mother move in. Oh. <laughs> and then during the whole pandemic. And at first it, I was like, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Of course not, of course not. It turned into like such a bad fairy tale thing of mm -hmm. 
Cinderella of, and, um, you know, I just, I, I could say it was an active imagination, but like, I really was trying to ignore it. Like all the tension from constantly like seeing my mother-in-law and mm -hmm. then the relationship breaking down with my fiance and everything. Um, and I just saw this shadow being in the corner of the bedroom. And no matter what I did, because like, I felt like I was at a crossroads mm -hmm. and the devil is always at the crossroads. Sure. And it was like, I can stick with this and I'll be financially set. Life will be okay. I'll just wait out this lady. Um, and I tried to ignore it and ignore it and it didn't go anywhere. And it was, it was heartbreaking. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. And I tried to ignore it. It wouldn't go any way. But, you know, miracles do happen. I came back home, um, started again, and I'm recently married. Oh, you did marry? Wed. You're I did wed. marry. Yes. Oh, good for you. Mm -hmm. We got married December 10th. So uh, it was a crazy story. Psychically, I was like, I am going nuts. But my whole world was falling apart. So, of course, my mind was falling apart as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, the pandemic, that was That'll awful. do it. <laughs> and, and, and that's so my that, story. So did anything ever happen with the, the dark entity? Um, well, mm, no. Um, I eventually left the situation. I just was like, I'm going to live with it and it's going to be here or I can leave. Mm -hmm. It was a battle, like two opposing forces. Mm. And I just had to retreat. Right. Well, um, you, you you remind me uh, you reminded me a bit of the movie um, A Beautiful Mind, where um, a man who ultimately won the Nobel Prize for mathematics um, was seeing psychogenic entities, and he always has done. Okay, he always did, uh, and he he got through it he got helped by uh some psychiatrists um he won the nobel prize for mathematics um but his entities were with him at the at the ceremony and um but he ultimately learned to live with them and he was a schizophrenic Okay, he was schizophrenic, and um, he ultimately lived a, a very successful life, and his wife was um, very helpful to him through most of it, um, and uh, she was there at the onset, and, and she stuck with him for most of the time, as I recall. I think there they might have separated finally after 40 years or something, but he ultimately was killed in an auto accident about 45 years after the events in the movie. Um, and, um, but, but Jung said, and he, uh, he had a, he, was friends or knew James Joyce and he actually wrote an essay uh, about Ulysses in volume 15 of the collected works and um, James Joyce came to him um, with his daughter who was schizophrenic and um, and he uh, 
And in order to explain the situation uh, to Joyce, he said, well, your daughter is drowning in the unconscious in which you can swim. Okay. And, and so, you know, the fact that you swam through it suggests to me that, you know, you can swim and, but others, you know, might get really freaked by something like that. Oh, well, you know, I recognize that those, anything I see, it's coming from within. There's, it's part mm -hmm. of me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, if I were to run from it, or like, that would just make it scary. And then, I mean, there's no reason. Yeah. Well, and when it happened to me, I had been, when, when my experience with Mephistopheles happened, and I, everybody knows this vision, so I'm not going to repeat it again. But I had a vision of Mephistopheles for about five seconds once driving along at 65 miles an hour. Um, fortunately, at that moment, I had been studying. Um, I had been studying Jung for many years. And, and so I knew that it was a psychogenic entity that and so in in that instant i made the faustian bargain which was you can have my immortal soul on my death provided none of my daughters think that of me for the rest of my life oh me went he left he was there and he went and so um and so far he's kept his side of the bargain <laughs> so um so anyway um you know these these things do exist in my case um i you know i i wasn't crazed in writing my novel i was trying to live my life normally and was able to for 22 hours a day but for those 2 hours a day that I was writing the novel, I closed the world out and did the act of imagination. That's all I can say. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, uh, we probably should go on. Let, let's see there. Uh, there are a couple of comments here. Uh, so Jamie says, so is this just reading? I said, no, it's not just reading. <laughs> and um, we're talking about these things. And Richard says, and then he heals it. And then if you trust in him, all your fears go away. All right. All this is just the noose if your reaction to things that God is watching you for. Uh, and Jamie says it's been overused. Richard says entities are fun. Susan says, I see something similar. Two opposing forces attract and repel. I feel this between Jung and the red one too. I see similar two opposing forces of attraction and repulsion in Jung's conversation and her and her story, I think she means Michelle's story. Um, and uh, and Richard said, do you believe that you really sold your soul? And um, I guess the answer to that is yes. Um, with, with reservation. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I can't speak to what will happen at the moment of my death, but um, what I do believe is that my spirit will survive um, the experience, and I know it will. And so the rest of it I don't care much about. Um, and... Um, <sighs> 
you know, I, I'll, I'll sum that up with an experience I had at my father's death. Um, we do have euthanasia in this country and uh, doctor, which we don't admit to, but we nonetheless have it. And um, I've been called upon in both my parents' cases to um, agree to increase their dosage in morphine. Uh, which ex expedites death. And, um, and so, so we do. So, I, but anyway, I, my father was dying and the doctor came to me and said, um, you know, your father's going to be dead in 24 hours. Um, I can either keep him conscious and, uh, he'll still feel pain or uh, he can die in his sleep. And one thing my father had always told me for his whole life was he hoped to die in his sleep. And uh, so I said, well, give him some morphine. Then. And um, I went home and uh, his favorite meal was sushi. And so we had gotten sushi from the local grocery store and we were having our dinner, um, my mother and my wife and I think my sister. And um, <clears throat> the phone call came in and said that my father had died and did we want to come and um, see the body? And I, I my response to that was uh, no he's with us here now and um, you know and it, that was just my intuitive response I didn't think about it at the time but um, you know his spirit has always been with me for my whole life so I know it's still with me now and simple as that um, and Richard says, what you believe is reality. Agreed. Okay. Uh, you're making, okay. So anyway, so moving on here. Um, so we've finished the active imagination conversation, uh, that Jung was having. Uh, there are three more pages um and uh i think this is jung's essay on this um here's what he says yeah, i'm on page 217 um surely this red one was the devil but my devil this that is he was my joy the joy of the serious person who keeps watch alone on the high tower. His red-colored, red-scented, warm, bright red joy. Not the secret joy in his thoughts and in his looking, but that strange joy of the world that comes unsuspected like a warm southerly wind with swelling fragrant blossoms and the ease of living. You know it, from your poets, this is seriousness. When they ex expectantly look toward what happens in the depths, sought out first of all by the devil because of their spring-like joy, it picks up men like a wave and drives them forth. Whoever tastes this joy forgets himself, and there is nothing sweeter than forgetting oneself. And not a few have forgotten what they are, but even more have taken root so firmly that not even the rosy wave is able to uproot them. They are petrified and too heavy, while the others are too light. Okay, there's a couple of footnotes that I, fa I failed to read, so I think I should read them. Uh, number 12, in a seminar in 1939, Jung discussed the historical transformation of the figure of the devil. He noted that, quote, 
when when he appears red, he is of a fiery, that is, passionate nature, and causes wantonness, hate, or unruly love. And it, it's a see children's dreams note from the seminar given in 1936 to 40. Uh, Lorenz Jung and Maria Meyer Gross translated. Okay, Ernst Falsetter and Tony Wolfson. Um, okay, then footnote 13. Uh, the draft continues. You have heard from Faust about how commanding this kind of joy is. The reference is to Goethe's Faust. And footnote 14. The draft has, as you have known from Faust, there are many who forget who they were because they let themselves be swept away. And that's on page 17, at 175. Um, any comment here? They... Oh, I have a comment. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, a lot of this just seems like... Um even before like a physical intoxication, there's like a spiritual and mental intoxication mm -hmm. about whatever it is that each person gets that chemical release. Yeah. And um, I think for a lot of people, it's going to be the news cycle in 2024. Mm -hmm. And um, just the importance of grounding you know, putting grounding in your everyday routine. And I tell myself, if I'm faithful to my practice, my practice will be faithful to me. That mm -hmm. means I practice it when I don't need it. And then when I get stressed, it'll be there. So I just tell myself, you know, during good days, when I think I've got everything handled to keep up with grounding and not getting swept away with things. And I'll pass. Uh, well, that that's certainly the answer. I mean, I I feel and know that when my time comes, I'm not going to worry about it per se. Uh, either I won't have time to worry about it because. I'm in an airplane crash or something like that, in which case there's, you don't have time to worry about it. Uh, but, you know, I always rely on the old saw, saw that is um, when you're dead, you don't know you're dead. It's only difficult for your family. Um, and when you're stupid, it works the same way. <laughs> so... Um, so I, I just leave it at that and don't go on. But let me read on here. I, this is Jung speaking in his essay now. I earnestly confronted my devil and behaved with him as with a real person. This I learned in the mysterium to take seriously every unknown wanderer who personally inhabits the inner world since they are real because they are effectual. And as footnote reads, uh, Jung elaborated this point in 1928 while presenting the method of active imagination. As against this, the scientific credo of our time has developed a superstitious phobia uh, about fantasy, but the real is what works. The fantasies of the unconscious work there can be no doubt about that. And that's from the relations between the I and the unconscious, Collected Works 7, paragraph 353. So I'll just read that paragraph or that sentence again and go on. This I learned in the Mysterium to take seriously every unknown wanderer who personally inhabits the inner world, since they are real because they are effectual. It does not help 
that we say in the spirit of this time, there is no devil. There was one with me. There was one with me. This took place in me. I did with him what I could. I could speak with him. A religious conversation is inevitable with the devil since he demands it. If one does not want to surrender to him unconditionally, because religion is precisely what the devil and I cannot agree about. I must have it out with him, as I cannot expect that he, as an independent personality, would accept my standpoint without further ado. I, I would be fleeing if I did not try to come to an understanding with him. If ever you have a rare, the rare opportunity to speak with the devil, then do not forget to confront him in all seriousness. He is your devil, after all. The devil is the adversary, is your own other standpoint. He tempts you and sets a stone in your path where you least want it. Taking the devil seriously does not mean going over to his side, or else one becomes the devil. Rather, it means coming to an understanding, thereby you accept your other standpoint. With that, the devil fundamentally loses ground, and so do you, and that may be well and good. Although the devil very much abhors religion for its particular solemnity and candor, it has become apparent, however, that it is precisely through religion that the devil can be brought to an understanding. What I said about dancing struck him because I spoke about something that belonged to his own domain. He fails to take seriously only what concerns others because that is the peculiarity of all devils. In such a manner, I arrive at his seriousness, and with this we reach common ground where understanding is possible. The devil is convinced that de dancing is neither lust nor madness, but an expression of joy, which is something proper to neither one nor the other. It is this I agree with the devil. In this, I agree with the devil. I'm just going to read that sentence again. The devil is convinced that dancing is neither lust nor madness, but an expression of joy, which is something proper to neither one nor the other. The in this, I agree with the devil. Therefore, he humanizes himself before my eyes, but I turn green like a tree in spring. Yet that joy is the devil, or that the devil is joy, has not to worry you. Has got to worry you. I'm sorry. Has got to worry you. I pondered this for over a week, and I fear that it has not been enough. You dispute the fact that your joy is your devil, but it seems as if there is always something devilish about joy. If your joy is no devil for you, then possibly it is for your neighbors, since joy is the most supreme flowering and greening of life. This knocks you down, and you must grope for a new path, since the light in that joyful fire has completely gone out for you. Or your joy tears your neighbor away and throws him off course, since life is like a great fire that torches everything in its vicinity. But fire is the element of the devil. When I saw that the devil is joy, surely I would have wanted to make a pact with him. But you can make no pact with joy because it immediately disappears. Therefore, you cannot capture the devil either. Yes, it belongs to his essence that he cannot be captured. He is stupid if he lets you he is stupid if he lets himself be caught, and you gain nothing from having yet one more stupid devil. The devil always seeks to saw off the branch on which you sit. That is useful and protects you from falling asleep and from the vices that go along with it. The devil is an evil element. But joy, if you run after it, you see that joy is also evil in it, or that joy also has evil in it, since then you arrive at pleasure 
and from pleasure go straight to hell, you own your own particular hell, hell, which turns out differently for everyone. Through my coming to terms with the devil, I accepted some of my seriousness, and I accepted some of his joy. This gave me courage. But if the devil has gotten more earnest, one must brace oneself. It is always a risky thing to accept joy, but it leads us to life and its disappointment, from which the wholeness of life becomes. Okay, I'll read some footnotes here. Um, footnote 16, uh, where he says, uh, hell turns out to be out differently for everyone. The draft continues. Every attentive person knows their hell, but not all know their devil. There are not only joyful devils, but also sad ones. And then this, but if the devil has gotten more earnest, you must brace uh, one must brace oneself, and the footnote reads, the draft continues. On a later adventure, I discovered how seriousness suits the devil, while seriousness certainly makes him more dangerous for you, it doesn't agree with him, believe me. And uh, finally, this sentence, uh, it was a risky thing to accept joy, or it is a risky thing to accept joy, but it leads us to life and its disappointment from which the wholeness of our life becomes. And the footnote reads, the draft continues. With this newly gained joy, I took off on adventures without knowing where they would lead. I could have known, however, that the devil always tempts us first through women. While I might have had clever thoughts as a thinker, it was not so in life. There I was even fatuous and prejudiced, and so quite ready to be caught in a fox trap. <laughs> okay, comments. That's the end, end of the red one, but um, I'll accept your comments. Richard says, the joy is the illusion mysteries. Anthony says, would it be topical to suggest it could be astral intoxication? Well, it surely, it surely could be astral intoxication. And, uh, you know, that's for every intoxication I would think but um, and then Richard says uh, it's having physical relations either with uh, with either God or demonic spirits it was the realization that was the devil that led me to be saved by Christ okay well fine Christ can save a lot of people and that brings my up my other thing that I wanted to talk about today, and I'm going to show it to you, but any comments before I do that? Okay, so um, the last um, uh, several weeks, uh, I've been teaching art in a local, uh, what, what they call a Title I school, which is a school that caters particularly to people who are impoverished. And uh, typically that just means people of color. And um, as a substitute teacher, I've been a substitute teacher since last fall. I'm 76 years old and I'm permanently handicapped in the sense that I have three um, joint replacements in my legs. And as a result, I walk with a cane which is um, 
incredibly interesting to my young students. I have about 300 young students, uh, grades uh, three through five, with except one exception, which is a second grade. Um, so they're quite young. Um, but in any case, um, for our confluence, we want to do a um, we want to do a collective unconscious of the group. Uh, we want to manifest the collective unconscious. And so one of the things that we're going to do is what is called a Rocky. Now, Rocky is the way you do it is you can take any piece of paper, the heavier, the better. Uh, but for example, you could cut, cut up a paper bag and take the, the large side of the paper bag, which might be 20 inches by 10 or something. And then you just put uh, watercolor randomly down on this uh, paper bag. And, um, but you can use better grade paper also. And I've I've shown some of the work of uh, my colleague, uh, um, Colleen Kiber, uh, which is wonderful in previous days. But recently I've, I've been uh, doing Rockies with my kids and um, uh, I just wanted to show you um, a couple that I did. Uh, so I'm going to share these with you. And um, all I have to do is figure out where I am on the screen. And uh, the first of these, um, I, I decided to photograph it so that I could um, show it to you. Um, Obviously, what what happens is the uh, you you're putting down the the watercolor quite um, randomly, and then what you do is every place that there's a boundary um, between colors, you draw a line. Now this one is not complete, but something jumped out at me immediately uh, as I started to do the process of lining it in and uh so i'm wondering does anybody in the panel see anything emerging from this image oh, oh. well skip I, with the like big blue like coming down i see that like as a snake and then like it turning into okay. like the snake turning into a head of a bird like a bird snake thing Mm hmm okay. Um, anything else? Anybody else see anything? Maybe a poster from the Golden Age. From the Golden Age. Okay, I don't, I don't know what that would be, but... Um, so, okay, is, is that your point, Mila? I see your hand, but... Was that you? Okay. Uh, and um, all right, let me see what else we have for guesses here. Um, Richard says a woman picking apples and uh, Nasreen says a sad face. Okay, well, um, what I saw, and uh, this, and mind you, I'm not, uh, I am certainly not a fundamentalist Christian, and I am not a proselytizer of such, um, but um, what I saw in this image is uh, the face of Christ, and you don't necessarily see it. Uh, I'm going to stop. In a minute, I'm going to stop the share and show you how I saw it, because I saw it by turning the image um, horizontally and looking at it upward. Um, 
And so I'm going to stop this share, which is a photograph of the piece straight on. And, and uh, it's not as obvious here. Um, and But here's where I see it. Uh, from up here, uh, going around here, I see this as the left cheek. Uh, and it's still not filled in entirely. And another cheek here. Uh, but most of all, I see these eyes. Here's an eye looking rather sad. And another eye here. And a, uh, a nose here. And so from, from this other view that I'm, I'll show you here momentarily, it struck me as an image of Christ. And, um, you know, that's, that's just me, but I'll, I mean, it comes from my unconscious, I guess I'm going to have to, I will terminate my, uh, my, uh, Looking for a minute, just a moment. All right. So here's here's the image, and if you look at it this way, very flatly, it seems to emerge more. Okay, and so that's how I saw it originally, and I said, "Oh my God, this is this is an image." You know, uh, a uh, archetypal image of Christ that I'm seeing here. And there's another whole large head and face here looking up. Um, and there are actually quite a number of, of images in it. Um, I have one other that I that is complete. This particular one I just showed you is not complete. Uh, but I've decided to stop on this one, and I call it uh, the Banshees. And uh, if you look in this piece, I don't, I have no idea how many uh, faces there are here, but there are at least uh, a couple of hundred, and and I see them everywhere in this image. Uh, but, for example, here you see a young person who's got a flower growing out of his nose. And I'm actually having to look at it backward because I've got my, uh, I've got my thing on mirror image. So I'm going to turn off my mirror so I can see it front, front ways the way I normally see it. Okay, so what I see here is a young person looking up, up here with a flower growing out of his nose. And his dad is here looking down rather severely. And his mother is here, this green is his mother looking down on him as he... <laughs> He responds to his parents, but actually there, if you look at this piece uh, carefully, I've, I've now discovered more than a couple hundred faces in this, in this piece. And so that always comes up in this, in this uh, painting style that uh, you always see something. And, um, Let's see, I, I guess I can I can share my screen again and show you that piece in a good photograph. So this is it. Um, so here's the young person. There's his nose. Here's the flower that grows up. And here's his eye looking up at his father. Here's his father looking down and his mother. And then you see all these other psychic beings or beings that are in my psyche that um, pretty much everywhere that you see a dot is an eye. Okay, there's an eye. And what has emerged 
and these i i decided to call it ban the banshees when i first saw these guys emerge and as you see they emerge from um from the boundaries of the colors in the random um in the random uh watercolor that i did um, it reminds me a bit of like japanese watercolors but mostly the golden age of posters i'm not sure if you're familiar with the golden age of posters um they were like very watercolory and handmade i think and um it, i don't think it was that easy to reprint them because the artists at the time they were very playful with uh with the paint um but if i can i interrupt you for yeah um, go ahead go ahead uh, for last week's discussion something that came to mind was um i don't know if it was the uh one of the apostles james but uh it, it, i think it was the old testament when jesus goes to hell and he sort of sees these souls that he can either redeem to salvation or just let them be there with their devil for their sins that, that they've committed and so i wonder if you know if whatever um so I'm a very big believer in like the balance of good and evil. And I believe that in Buddhism, it's like, if you do too much good, that's not good. If you do too much bad, then you're evil. But you always have to have this equilibrium of, you know, of what's fair, even if that makes you a bad person to someone else, you can't always be the hero. <laughs> you can't always right. be the good guy. Because you know it has to be a, a justified reason as to why you are being unfair to a certain person and um you know so you have to always have that equilibrium so i'm not sure exactly what exactly the sin was that jesus committed maybe he was um exposing knowledge too much and you know maybe becoming too infatuated with wisdom but either way he ends up in hell and you know so his purpose may have been to you know help the people the souls that are uh trapped in well, hell to to go into the gates of heaven um but it's it's very complicated and and that's sort of what i was thinking of um and especially when reading dante's inferno and dante is trapped in hell and he's going through all these different levels of hell and learning, you know, the lessons of each sin. And so right. I wonder if, 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 uh, if those two have anything to do with Jung's uh, possible unconscious of connecting those uh, stories and those figures into his literature and his dreams. Well, of course they do. And um, the, um, let's see. First of all, I, I should mention to you that that I intend to, to call this piece that I showed you, the one with Jesus's face, uh, the harrowing of hell, uh, because, because there are so many other images and spirits there. Um, but it, uh, and both, both of these pieces have lots of spirits in them. Um, and um, I know that those spirits are right here, okay? They're here right now, okay? And the reason I know that is because when, uh, when I had my knee replacement, uh, I was, I guess I had some good drugs there for a while, and um, I had a... I had a dream or a vision of uh, something like a, a black ball um, to my left side. And in that black ball were about a hundred spirits and they were trying to communicate with me in one way or another. 
And um, it was very disconcerting. It happened in the middle of the night. Um, and, uh, but I do have a sense sometimes that there are lots of spirits about. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, that's basically all I can say about that, but, um, it, it's something that happened to me. I, I admit it happened under anesthesia, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but certainly, the, and I, I guess that in uh, in Harry Potter, wasn't there one scene where there there was a, kind of a ball of spirits that was getting uh, whacked around in, in the in the game, whatever the game was, um, cabbage or something, whatever the game was in Harry Potter. Um, but that I think, if, as I recall, there were were spirits in that ball as well, um, and um, and uh, Richard says natural spirits are everywhere, and they show up in digital pictures. Yep, they do. Um, and uh, one of the things I wanted to mention um, about what you said on Buddhism was it may comport with Jung's idea of joy in terms of balancing because people who are devout Buddhists tend to be very committed to it and um, you know you can't you can't attribute uh, any you can't attribute evil to them um and uh, and one of those is my wife for example but uh she does have joy and so we could think of it in this way where joy is pleasure um she and i uh, among other things love sailing although we haven't been able to do it recently because of um, my physical condition. But uh, when we were first together and married, um, we did a lot of sailing and we would uh, charter a large sailboat and uh, a 37 foot sailboat and take it out on Chesapeake Bay, just the two of us. And we had wonderful joy doing that. Well, uh, of course, then we get a, a kind of commitment um, amount of guilt from that because we've all we've both been uh, worked in um, in deprived communities, uh, both in the United States and overseas, and it you can feel quite selfish uh, about taking that weekend of joy in the in the sailing so that's a, that can be the kind of balance that we're talking about it doesn't mean that you're um committing a sin in the sense that um the ten commandments might talk about but certainly if you if you take joy knowing that and joy of that kind which involves using a hundred thousand dollar sailboat um it you can feel quite guilty from doing that and yet that's the kind of balance that you need because um otherwise you couldn't do the work with the deprived communities i know that in my early travel to india i was trying to not be too ostentatious so ostentatious so i was uh, insisting on staying in business hotels which were not even one star and um i i did that for two trips uh to india in the early 1990s and uh one night uh 
a rat ran across my legs. And uh, I said, okay, that's that. I'm not doing that anymore. And so ever after that, uh, I stayed in the five-star hotels of India. And as a result of that, I was able to go back uh, 42 more times total. And, um, but as a result of that, I brought an entire industry to India. And one of my friends says that because of my work, we created jobs for about 25,000 people. Uh, or no, I'm sorry. Yes, 25,000 people, which created a living for a quarter of a million people, 10 to 1, the ratio 10 to 1. So the people had jobs, but by creating those jobs, those created other jobs and provided food for 10 times as many people. So, um, so uh, you know, I can, I can feel the guilt of staying in the five-star hotel, but knowing that if I had to stay in the ho in the hotel where the rats ran across my legs, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have been able to do that. And so you do have to um, balance these things in your psyche over time. Okay, other comments? Um, I like how Young says that, where he says that off the devil often something tempts with women, and it goes both ways. Women get tempted too, sure. and um, it always starts off good in the in the beginning. It is like a relationship with the devil. It's so good in the beginning, honeymoon, flowers, yep. oh. vacations, and then just gradually, yeah. Um, it turns into a hellscape and mm -hmm. um, I'm really into movies. Um, I kind of think that movies are like modern day temples and stuff. Yep. And, and, and um, education. It's how we're, we educate people these days. Yeah. And um, I saw this movie Renfield and it's, mm -hmm. it has Nicolas Cage playing Dracula and it's about him having his, uh, man servant butler and like they're and the butler is all like going to 12-step groups trying to get away from like the mental prison and it's mm -hmm. yeah so it is like a relationship starts off great yep yep well <laughs> and and, and uh, you need a balance in any relationship you know like i'm currently navigating one and it is a ship you have smooth waters choppy waters yep gotta navigate it yeah well it's um yeah any relationship requires navigation and and when i left my first wife and moved in with my second wife those two events happened on the same day uh in other words i left my marriage of 17 years and moved in with my uh with the woman who became my second wife and uh, who's been together with me now for um, 37 years or something like that. Uh, or maybe, yeah, is it 37? Yeah, I think it's 37 years. And so, um, and there was, you know, certainly joy and evil in my first marriage and there there's evil in leaving uh, a family like that which i didn't i only left them physically not financially so i'm still quite close to my three daughters and and uh i regard my ex-wife as kind of a sister now i still love her but um not in the biblical <laughs> it's so funny that that you bring up um the 12 steps michelle because um someone had actually went over a patient of jung's had asked him 
desperately to help him with his alcoholism. And Jung, uh, you know, he, I think that probably Carl Gustav Jung is like one of the original uh, founders, if not inspirations for peer support, because <laughs> all, of, all of his peers came to him for, for help. And oh, so absolutely. this... And so this man, he, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he went to his friend Billy, or was it Bob? Wait, uh, yeah. um, Bill. He, it was, Bill I w. think it was Billy. Yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill W. So he asked Bill W, you know, we should do something about the 12 steps. And then um, Bill and Bob created Alcoholics Anonymous. And something that is very intriguing is that uh, it, in one of the traditions, or was it the steps, it says, we admitted that we were helpless to alcohol. And I wonder if it's possible that maybe Jung may have had some kind of like substances that he was using at the time. Because I know that Sigmund Freud was a, fan of cocaine <laughs> during yeah. his time so well, it was a different world back then but you know um when when someone is under the influence it could definitely have some uh, some other influence on the on the other consciences of the mind on the other parts of the mind yeah let me uh, just mention because you're talking about the the origins of Alcoholics Anonymous. There is a book which usually usually is within my arm's reach, but I. But I'm I mean, we live in an alcoholic, you know, yeah. using the alcoholic term, uh, addictive society. Absolutely, and yeah. so there's okay. a book called um, Carl Jung and the Fa and the Founding about Alcoholics Anonymous, and. Uh, this the story that you told is recounted. It's a little bit different. Um, this gentleman went to see Jung, and um, Jung worked with him for a period of time. And um, he had a he had a a realization, and he then was friends of with Bill W. And and Bill W. was going to kill himself with alcohol at the time. He was in the process of doing it. And uh, he learned about this experience of this gentleman and, you know, was able to get off alcohol. And from that, um, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded. Now, Jung did not know this. Jung was not um, involved in the actual development of Jung, of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, but um, in 1961, just before Jung's death, Bill W. did write to Jung and mentioned that it was his... Um, his original work with this other man that was the founding kernel of Alcoholics Anonymous and was the idea that helped Bill get off alcohol, alcohol in the first place and give him the impetus to actually develop the organization. And now, of course, there are 12-step programs in all kinds of addictive situations, but... Michelle, did you? Oh, um, yeah, it's like a very famous story. And I just yeah. remember like, uh, there's a part in the story where Bill, Bill was actually drunk where, when his friend came to see him. Right. And he was all like, um, oh, you've gone religious. I thought you were coming here to drink and have fun. And yeah. then the friend was like, oh, you can drink. I'm just going to talk. And there's a part in the story where Bill was like, yeah, yeah, I've heard all this God stuff before. But then he realizes, he looks over the table and he realizes that his friend was inwardly reorganized through oh. and through. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't understand how 
that was possible completely because he said that he was just even more of a drunk than he was. Mm -hmm. So it that was the part that intrigued him and it, it intrigues me to see someone in that you used to know come back inwardly reorganized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I think that's what happens. Uh that people are, do change. Uh, they, they definitely, assuredly do. Um, and, and going back, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Go ahead and, 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 you know, and uh, back to what Michelle was bringing up about this movie, which I have not seen, but I can definitely see some power and control dynamics there. And that's certainly something that people who have a substance dependency, that's usually how they feel. They feel overpowered or powerless over the substance. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting that um, like a lot of times when I've been to like, uh, because I, I think I told Skip before or everyone on YouTube <laughs> that um my father's a gypsy so i have a lot of psychics in my life and so mm -hmm. uh i went over to a voodoo priestess once and she was uh practicing like haitian voodoo and drinking uh i think it was like rum or bourbon or something and smoking tobacco and you know so it's so interesting because you have all these different cultures that use substances to like and invoke like the spirit world or go and travel through these dimensions and other worlds or what have you and it's just so amazing and I wonder sometimes like is that what may have happened to Bill and Bob like could they have been so disillusioned by their reality that <laughs> they had to stop using alcohol like what you know it, it, it's just so interesting to me yeah well it, it is True, and obviously, as I was reading uh, this piece about the red one, um, you know, I'm at the process of reading it, reading that act of imagination uh, takes us all through it. Um, and um, it, you know, everybody envisions it in a different way, perhaps, but, um, you know, I think now, in, in more fullness of time, we do recognize these things, and and it's largely due to uh, Jung in the first place, but then um, uh, then Bill W. and his development of the twelve step program that has you know served as a, as a uh, a solution for millions now, I believe, and. And uh, thank God for that. Uh, you know, I had one grandfather who died of alcoholism at age 68. And, uh, woo, it wasn't pretty, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the last time I saw him alive was the day I graduated from college. And that was it. He died very shortly after that. Um, and, uh, you know, but that wasn't indicative of his, you know, his normal physiology. Now, me, I don't know why, but I've never been interested in, in any any substance such that you know, I have, I've done a lot of drinking in my time, but not, not to the point of dependence upon it. And I've never had any draw toward being dependent on a substance other than life. Life itself is, is really addicting. <laughs> so that's what I find. Uh, okay, uh, so next week, what will we do? We will be moving on. We will be on page 220, and we will be reading um, the uh, An Act of Imagination again, and it's called The Castle in the Forest.
And there's some very profound things um, in, in this section uh, and in the section that's following. It's a very powerful part of the Red Book. Um, and um, I hope you'll all join us. Any last thoughts, Patrick or Neil or Michelle, before we wrap up for today? Okay. Uh, well, we will wrap up for today and I'll see you next week. Uh, nice seeing you today. Take care.